woman or a woman in the wilderness. And it's based on Revelation chapter 12. And I think it's always a good idea to start by reading the passage that we're going to be considering. And in the weeks ahead, we're going to talk about Revelation 12, Revelation 13, Revelation 14. We're getting into the heart of some of these last day prophecies, but we always thought it was really important to build a foundation first, which is what we've been doing. Um, let's start with Revelation 12:1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems or crowns on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there for 1,260 days. Now I want to jump down to verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she's nourished for a time and a times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the remnant or the rest of her offspring that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Who is this woman? We know who the dragon is. Woman that flees into the wilderness. Woman that brings forth a man child. Right here in the center of Revelation is one of the key characters and one of the most important studies in the topic or the subject of Revelation. So the lesson is a woman in a wilderness. We always like to begin with a historical. We like to tie the Old and the New Testament together. Uh, most of us know the story of Solomon, how he prayed for wisdom. And God said, I'm going to give you wisdom unlike anyone who is before you. And one of the many examples of his wisdom that's very famous is it tells us in the Bible that there were two women that uh, had children. They were women out of wedlock. They lived in the same home. They both got pregnant about the same time. They gave birth about the same time. And then one night, one of the ladies, when she was sleeping, she accidentally overlaid her little infant child and suffocated it. When she woke up during the night to nurse the baby and saw it was dead, she was devastated. And then she heard her companion's baby whimpering and she thought, I'm too ashamed for anyone to know what I've done. She put her dead baby in that place and took the live baby to herself. Well, when the women got up in the morning, the one woman went to go nurse her baby and it was dead. And she looked at it and said, this is not my baby. And the other one said, no, that's your baby. This one's my baby. And so this was a great dispute. The judges didn't know what to do with it, so it came to the king. And you know, of course, what Solomon said. He said, well, one of you is saying the living baby is yours and the dead baby is hers and vice versa. He said, well, the only thing you can do is split the baby in two, which has become a proverb in our society to divide the baby. And Solomon told his soldier, let's divide the baby. And the soldier goes for the baby and the real mother threw herself down before Solomon and said, oh, my Lord, the king, don't do that. Give her the baby, but don't kill it. And the other one said, no, oh, it's a fair thing to do. Let's just split the baby. Solomon said, well, obviously, this is the real mother. And people were so impressed by his wisdom that uh, was revealed when the soldier pulled out his sword. Now, what does a sword represent in Bible truth? It represents the word of God. It tells us that uh, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews chapter 4. What does a woman represent in Bible symbology? A woman is the church. And when we look in Revelation 12 at this beautiful, glorious woman, clothed with light, she must be the true church. Then there's another woman. There's only two women in Revelation. 
You got the true woman in Revelation 12. You got a counterfeit woman in Revelation 17. She's called the mother of harlots. So you don't have to guess if she's good or bad, right? It's pretty clear. So we're going to be talking. We'll be using the sword of God's spirit to figure out how do you identify the true church in a world today where you've got hundreds, if not thousands, of different Christian denominations. And I want to reiterate that I believe there are Christian people in many different churches. Does everyone hear me? Many different denominations, there are people that love the Lord, and one denomination does not have a copyright on salvation. But God does have a people and a movement in the last days that he's going to pull people together. How do you know? We're going to go to our uh, people on the street. We're going to get some feedback about what they say regarding these issues of the church. I have a hard time saying that there's one religion that's true. Um, I think I was blessed to, to find a religion that is closest to the Bible, which would be true. The Bible's true. I feel like everybody's valid in their beliefs. And there are many roads that go to the same location. So one might be quicker than the other, but if you, if you don't mind taking the scenic route, then go ahead. So if you believe that what you believe is true, I feel like that is sincerity. Um, and then God or whoever you believe in will reveal his truth to you. So. You can't even tell because everyone was born with a family that raised in a different culture or different religion. So it's, it's hard to tell. You just gotta live with the flow with the family that you came from. I don't believe there's one true religion. I believe all of them have some kind of truth to them. Why does there need to be one that is right and wrong? You know, um, you know they're all tools. Um, a carpenter doesn't use one tool. Your goal should be to understand the Bible and to find a church that teaches the Bible and living out the Bible. Not just a church that teaches you knowledge about the Bible, but a church that teaches you how to live out the Bible. And a church that is uh, evangelism minded. All right, with the exception of the last person who commented there, you can tell from the people in the culture, they kind of say, who knows what the truth is and who knows if there's anyone and all the rivers lead to the ocean and people are very nebulous and ambivalent about, is there any absolute truth? Can you use the Bible to find out what is truth? You know, Jesus told his disciples, all men will know that you are my uh, disciples by your love for one another. He said that by our unity, we'd be demonstrating that uh, what the truth is to the world. The devil heard that, and he's worked harder to divide Christians than any religion of the world. There's more divisions of Christianity than inner, any religion there is. And there's great differences in some of the doctrinal teachings. Does that mean that we can't know what truth is? And does it matter? Jesus said, thy word is truth. Where do you go to find truth? How do you know which is the true mother? Use the sword. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to use the Word of God. Let's get to our lesson for tonight. We'll begin with question number one. How does Revelation picture God's true church? Now, we just read this to get our background. You read in Revelation 12, verse 1, pictured as a what? A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Who is this woman? Some say, well, this is Mary. And you can look around if you look at a lot of the, uh, the medieval art, you'll often see Mary standing on paintings and sculptures of Mary, standing on the moon, 12 stars above her head. She's holding the baby, and uh, she'll have a halo of like sun behind her. You've probably seen this before. But how could this be Mary? It says she flees into the wilderness where she's persecuted for 1260 years. This is a broad picture of God's true church. Jesus said to the church, you are the light of the world. Now, these are the lights that God made. God made the sun, God made the moon, God made the stars. It's God's light. This woman has God's light. She is great with child, and she's getting ready to bring forth this man-child, this singular man-child, and the dragon is standing before the woman to devour the child as soon as it's born. The devil is not too happy with that. That's the second part of our question. Revelation 12, verse 2. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. The purpose of the church was to introduce the world to the Messiah and to really be uh, a place that presents salvation to the world. It's to be, you might even say, a hospital for sinners. One reason I think that the church is portrayed as a woman is 
Typically, by nature, women are more nurturing than men. Women are more sensitive than men. They're more caring. You know, we are connected with a self-supporting ministry. 75 or 80% of the checks are written by women that are moved by needs. It's not that men don't ever or don't ever care, but I think we all know that God's designed women, for one thing, that they're designed to bring forth children, to nurture those children. And so this is something like what the church is supposed to do in the world, is to be um, bringing people to Christ and helping to multiply the kingdom for Jesus. This woman is standing on the moon. What does the moon represent? It's the Old Testament promises and prophecies that support the New Testament. The New Testament is Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. You read in Malachi chapter 4 that the Son of Righteousness will arise, and that's not S-O-N, it's S-U-N. The Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in His wings. It's talking about the light of the New Testament gospel. Twelve stars above her head, what does that represent? What's twelve represent in the Bible? How many, it's, 12, it's a number for the church. How many apostles, New Testament? Twelve. Old Testament, how many patriarchs? Twelve. They figured there were twelve judges, and I think I told you that um, there were also, in the New Testament, you've got twelve Jewish apostles that were chosen, then Paul goes to Ephesus, and he baptizes twelve Gentiles. And I thought that was an interesting number, too. New Jerusalem, twelve gates, twelve foundations, tree of life, twelve different kinds of fruit, twelve times a year, and the, the Bible tells us that it's 12,000 furlongs around. Twelve is a number for the church, principally the leadership. The stars are above her head, and that usually typifies leadership in the Bible. So this is God's church getting ready for the Messiah to come and be introduced to the world, but the dragon wants to stop it. It says that she bears a male child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now, who is that? That's Jesus. He's the king, right? And then her child is caught up to God and to his throne. Did Jesus ascend to heaven? In Acts chapter 1, you see that. And uh, can the devil reach Jesus now? No. So he turns his fury upon the woman. We'll get to that in just a moment. So now I'm jumped ahead a little bit. I kind of tipped my hand. Question number two, who is the great red dragon? And what does he try to do? Who is the dragon? He tells you right in that same chapter, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. How can that be misunderstood? Serpent, dragon, devil, Satan. He is the arch fiend that is bringing all the evil into our world. Jesus called the devil the prince of this world. He's kind of hijacked or kidnapped this world because the original parents of the human race, God made man in his own image, and he was given the ability to have dominion over this planet, and then... Adam and Eve basically handed the keys over to the devil. You and I are all suffering as civilian casualties in this war, but Jesus didn't want to lose us, so he came into the world as a man to live among us and to save us, to show us what God is like, to show us what the, the Father is like, to die for our sins, to teach us how to live. So it says that the dragon, he stands before, he's cast out of heaven, that old serpent of old called the devil and Satan, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Did the devil make an effort as soon as Jesus was born to kill him as a baby? Have you read there in Matthew where King Herod, he was so jealous that there was another king of the Jews, he sent his soldiers into Bethlehem when the wise men did not return, and he ordered them to kill all the male children two years old and under. That was the devil that was behind Rome doing that. It's not the first time. You can see in Egypt, the devil thought that a savior was coming for the children of Israel. He, he thought it, it would be one of the Jewish children. He had the Pharaoh killing not all the babies, all the male babies. Have you noticed that? Bethlehem, all the male babies. And then when Athaliah became queen of Judah, the devil again knew that through the seed of David, a savior was coming. And so she went to annihilate all the descendants of David, all the male children. So through history, in the Old Testament, the devil was trying to keep the Savior from coming and destroy him as he was a baby. Now, something else I think you'll find interesting, when Mary finally does give birth, a miracle birth, there are seven miracle births in the Bible. Each one of the children in those miracle births are types of Christ. Let me list them for you very quickly here. Sarah 
has a miracle baby, right? Abraham and Sarah, they're old. The baby, what's his name? Isaac. Isaac was a type of Christ. I mean, think about it. Isaac goes up the mountain to the place of sacrifice as a willing sacrifice with his father. He's got the wood on his back as Jesus had the cross on his back. But instead of dying, he comes down alive. It's like a resurrection. Rebecca was barren. And the Bible tells us that Isaac prayed and they had twins. And one of her twins is named Jacob. Jacob's a type of Christ. He is the leader of the 12 patriarchs as Jesus has the 12 apostles. Rachel, her firstborn, was called Joseph. Is Joseph a type of Christ? There is no more vivid type of Christ in the Bible than Joseph. Sold by his brothers for the price of a slave, he forgives them, he feeds the whole world with his bread of life during a time of famine. The Bible says Joseph knows them, but they don't know him. And Jesus came unto his own, and they knew him not. I could go on and on talking about Joseph, who was separated from his father to save the world. The whole world was fed through Joseph. All right, so you've got uh, Rachel. Then you've got Hannah. What was her son's name? Samuel, which means God hears. Samuel was this remarkable from birth. He was dedicated as a priest, a prophet, a judge. Jesus is our high priest. He is the greatest prophet. He is our judge. And he led the nation in revival. He was a great intercessor. And then you've got Mrs. Manoah. We don't know her name, but Manoah's wife has a baby. What was his name? Samson. Samson. You might think, Pastor Doug, Samson? How could he be a type of Jesus? That's interesting. In the end of Samson's life, he prays. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He stretches out his arms. He knocks down that temple of Dagon. And it says he killed more by his death than he did by his life. Samson was betrayed by his own people to the Philistines. Samson was sold for silver through Delilah, wasn't he? It's a lot of ways where Samson's a type of Christ. That was a miracle birth. Mrs. Manoah was barren. Then you've got a Shunammite woman. She has a miracle boy through the prophecy of Elisha. Her boy dies working in the field, but he's resurrected miraculously like Jesus. Then you go to the New Testament and you've got Zacharias and Elizabeth. They are barren. They have John the Baptist. He, of course, is a forerunner of Jesus. And then the final miracle birth is Jesus. All of these miracle births, most cases they were barren women, or in Mary's case, she was a virgin. And uh, they were all telling us about when this ultimate man-child would come. You know, there's a prophecy in 1 Samuel 2.5. Hannah was saying, those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she who had many children has become feeble. This is played out again in Revelation. So that was for free. It's not in your lesson, but hopefully that is helpful. And when you see all these stories in the Bible, they all point to Christ. Number three, what happens after Satan fails to destroy Jesus? You read in Revelation 12:5. We read this before, her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And from there it says, Jesus rules all the nations with a rod of iron. After Jesus, question four, was caught up to heaven, what did Satan do to the church? It tells us in Revelation 12, 13, when the dragon saw that he'd been cast to the earth, he cannot reach Jesus, but he wants to hurt Jesus, it says he persecuted the woman. Now who is this woman in Revelation 12? She's a church. She's wearing light. You go to Revelation 17, it says the woman is wearing gold and pearls and scarlet and costly array, and it's not talking about the same kind of light. It's artificial man-made. This is God's church filled with the light of God. The devil has then vented his fury on the church. Quick history. After Christ ascended to heaven, he poured the Holy Spirit out on the church Christianity began to spread like fire all through uh, the Roman Empire. And even in Paul's day, he says the gospel's been preached to every creature. And um, the more they tried to persecute Christians, the more Christianity spread. And you've probably heard about where the different Caesars, they, you know, made Christianity was called religio illicite, forbidden religion. And Christians were thrown to the lions in the Colosseums and they were burnt. Nero was supposedly... He'd smear them with pitch and he'd burn the Christians. But uh, the more that he persecuted the church, the more the church grew. So the devil then said, this is not working. And he went to plan B. 
Plan A was just annihilate Christians, but the more he, it's like trying to get rid of your weeds by mowing them. They just spread the seeds. And he said, I've got to find something else. I'm going to try to destroy the church through infiltration. That's what he did by putting Jesus, or Judas, in Jesus' group. And um, by getting them to compromise. See, the devil is not worried about Christianity if he can dilute the truth so we lose our impact. The devil is not worried about people saying they're Christians and going to church and singing if we're not living holy lives. If we're not preaching the real gospel about salvation from sin and the real power of the gospel, the devil doesn't mind. Matter of fact, the devil prefers if we have the facade of Christianity and we don't have the power. Paul talks about a people in the last days that have a form of religion with no power. God wants us to have the real McCoy, amen? So what the devil did is he got, he kind of came into the church and through Constantine, the Roman emperor, Constantine was a pretty shrewd politician. He said, Christians really aren't hurting anybody. All these things about Nero said the Christians were cannibals because he heard that in their services that they would eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus, which of course was symbolic. There's no cannibalism going on. And so he spread terrible rumors about Christians. Constantine realized that was all nonsense, and he said, they're not hurting anybody. We ought to make peace with them. We've got enemies on the outside right now we're fighting. He claimed to have a vision where he said he was supposed to now conquer under the sign of the cross. And to show his sincerity, his mother converted to Christianity. Constantine then ordered his army to march through the Tiber River in Rome, and he says, you have all been baptized. So you're all Christians now. But the problem was they had no teaching. We learned before baptism there should be some teaching, right? Go teach, baptize. They went into the water, dry pagans, and they came up wet pagans. And all of a sudden, almost overnight, all these pagan teachings came into the church and they got commingled with Christianity. So now Christians who were, you know, um, not involved at all in idols, they had idols of pagan deities everywhere in Rome and Greece and throughout the empire, and they said, what do we do with all these beautiful idols? And some of the Christian leaders said, you know, we'll probably reach more pagan if we don't make them change too quickly. Let them just rename their idols. And all of a sudden, they're praying to Peter, James, John, and they just rename their idols. I don't know if you're aware, but it is true that the statue of St. Peter that you find in St. Peter's Basilica is very old. It's older, older than Peter. It was in the Pantheon in Rome, and it was the statue of Jupiter. You ever seen it? He's got like this, and he's got, to, you know, he's sitting down on a throne. He's got a big halo or, or a solar disk behind his head, and, and you think, is that Peter? And uh, so they basically subsumed all of these rites and ceremonies that were not in Christianity. And then you entered a period of time where you had a commingling of Christianity. You read where the truth would be cast to the ground in Daniel chapter 8. And so a lot of compromise happened, and the Christians began to lose the vitality. Instead of Christianity going with love as our power, the Roman Emperor Justinian told the new bishop of Rome, later called the Pope, says, I'm giving you an army, and if people don't comply, you can use the army to force them to love Jesus. Well, that's not how Jesus operates. And instead of the church becoming a movement of love, it started to become a political institution. So, the real Christians kind of had to flee into the wilderness at this point, which is where we go in question number five. Where did the woman go during this terrifying period of persecution? And here's a time prophecy. How long did it last? You read in Revelation 12, verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there for 1,260 days. First, let's talk about the wilderness. When Elijah was being persecuted and the prophets by Jezebel, Jezebel's a woman who represents that evil church, where did Elijah go? He went into the wilderness. How long was he there? 1,000, there's a famine for 1,260 days. That's three and a half years. It also uses the time period 42 months. The children of Israel, God brought them into the wilderness. Uh, when they had fled the slavery of Egypt. You'll find that time period of 1,260, three and a half years, 42 months, and just be aware, in the Jewish calendar, there's six, uh, 30 days to the month. 
So they didn't use the calendar we use. It was a, a lunar calendar. And so 42 months adds up, do the math, 1,260. Three and a half years, 1,260. How long did Jesus teach? 1,260 days. It usually represents a time of persecution. At the end of that, he was killed. Um, then from the time of Christ until Stephen, the first martyr, three and a half years later, 1,260 days. You can often see at the end of that period of time, there's just like a great showdown. Uh, during 1,260 days of um, Elijah's time, you had uh, persecution where you had the, the church, Jezebel, was putting in Baal worship and she was mixing Baal worship with um, the uh, religion of the Jews. And she married the state, King Ahab, and they were persecuting the prophets of God. After that 1,260 year period, Elijah had to flee into the wilderness. After the showdown on Mount Carmel, I'm assuming some of you know these Bible stories, so I'm going quickly. Elijah fled into the wilderness and he was protected. God spoke to him there. And so you'll find the church had to go under, underground. But we're talking about a period of time during the Dark Ages. They're not literal days. What is a day equal in Bible prophecy? So we're not talking about these Old Testament 1,260 days. We're talking about 1,260 years. From 538 A.D., what happened in 538? That's the same year that Justinian, the Roman emperor, he gave an army to the bishop of Rome, like I said, later known as the pope, gave him political power. He left town and went to Constantinople. And from that time until Napoleon came along in 1798, the church in Rome became Christianity, sort of got commingled with politics and persecution. There were inquisitions and genuine Bible Christians kind of had to go underground. They literally fled into the wilderness. Some of them in North Africa, some of them in the Alps. There are groups like the Albigenses and the Hussites and the Waldenses, and uh, they kind of fled literally into the wilderness to avoid the persecution that was in the big cities. So this literally happened. It was this combination of church and state that began to persecute. 538 to 1798, what happened in 1798? Napoleon sent his general Berthier into Rome and the Pope was arrested and they had lost their unbroken power from 538 to 1798. You do the math, that's 1,260 years. And the church during that time had gone underground. After that time, they ended up having uh, more freedom and Bibles were being printed. A lot of things changed then. Now, I know I'm going fast. We're going to recover some of this in future studies. What are two other identifying marks of God's church, according to Revelation 12, verse 17? The dragon, who is he again? The devil was enraged or wroth, if you've got a King James Version, with the woman. Who, who is she? Which woman? True church, this woman of light. Obviously, if the dragon is wroth with her, is she the right woman? Yeah, the, if the devil's mad at you, you're doing something right. Isn't that true? You can be pretty sure of it. He was enraged with the woman, and he goes to make war with the rest of her offspring. It's not just her now. It's those who have been converted through her influence that is spreading. This is in the last days now. And it says, rest of her offspring who have a couple of characteristics that keep the what? The commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you look in Revelation 19, verse 10, it says the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. You know, what is the, um, the law and the prophets? You've got, um, it says here, remember the law of Moses. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet. The commandments of God, the law of Moses. Elijah the prophet, the spirit of prophecy. The law and the prophets is a symbol for the word of God. This woman has the word of God and the devil is wroth with her. Now, I'm just gonna let you take a breath for a second because I'm gonna make a little speech. And uh, kind of, we're just going to drift from the lesson because I want to get the big picture for you. Christianity is extremely divided. Do you think that's God's will? Is Jesus coming for a fragmented church or is he coming for a victorious, glorious, successful church when he returns? Something has to happen before he comes back. There needs to be a big transition. How do you think the average person picks a church? 
I was in uh, South Dakota visiting my son, and uh, we saw this little church on the side of the road. It must be one of the smallest churches in the world. And I said, there's a church I think I could handle. You can fit the pastor and maybe a, a couple getting married in there. <laughs> I didn't even go inside, but I thought it was kind of cute. But uh, how do you find the true church? I heard about, uh, Karen and I did evangelism in Russia right after communism fell oh, 27 years ago. And uh, someone said, we're going to take you to our supermarket. We were in Stavropol, and they took us to their supermarket. And they said, oh, it's a good day. We got 10 things today. That was their supermarket. Usually it was like one thing on the street at a vendor, one thing, one thing. And people would stand in line, and the thing, they had like bread, milk, cheese, some meat. There was just some really basic things. And I heard about a Russian gentleman during that era that migrated to the United States. And he said, so what do you Americans eat for breakfast in the morning? And someone said, well, we eat cereal. Oh, so he went to the local mega supermarket, and he said, where is the cereal? He pointed him to an aisle longer than an airport terminal. And he goes and he starts walking days up the aisle. And he thought, how do I pick cereal? You got cereal with, you know, Count Chocula on the cover, and you got leprechauns on the cover, and you got healthy old people walking, and you got, uh, you know, cornflakes, and you got sports heroes on the cover, and you just, how do you pick a cereal? Have you ever noticed how many different kinds of cold cereal? You think they'd find two or three that would make everybody happy. You know how I pick my cereal? It's not the picture on the box. I ignore the picture on the box. I flip over to the side, and I look to see how much sugar does it have? What kind of grains are in there? Does it have fiber in it? Is it all just mush? <laughs> I look at the ingredients. How do you pick a church? How do most people pick churches? I'll tell you, I don't know if I'll remember it all, but there's about 10 different re ways that people pick a church. It's the church that their family went to, they grew up in. Why do you go to that church? It's where my family's always gone. They were born this way, we're gonna die that way. Doesn't matter right or wrong, that's what my family did, that's what I'm gonna do. Um, they pick a church, it's close to the house. That's great to have a church close to the house. They pick a church, the pastor is charismatic and good looking. And I know that's why you're all here tonight, right? <laughs> why, why are you laughing? <laughs> they pick, it's true though, some, that's why some people pick the church. They pick the church because the music. Why do you go there? Oh, the organ vibrates the building. It's wonderful. The choir, I want to be in the choir. They got a choir. What do they believe? I don't know, but that's where I'm going. You ask the average person, what does your church teach? He says, well, we believe just like our pastor. Well, what does your pastor believe? Well, he believes like us. <laughs> well, what do you and your pastor believe? Same thing. <laughs> You're just, yeah. People really don't know the ingredients. Or they pick a church because this is the church where the important people go. They say, if you want to get anywhere in this town, your connections, that's the church. I understand for generations in Washington, D.C., as various presidents have attended different churches, people start calling those churches every Sunday to say, uh, is the president coming this week? They want to be there when the president goes. And I heard of one pastor, I think it was when George Bush used to visit a Methodist church with Laura, and they always wanted to know when the pastor, when the president was coming. I said, will the president be here? And he'd say, well, I'm not so sure, but God will be here, <laughs> if that matters. Or they pick a church because the building. The architecture. Why do you go to that church? Oh, the stained glass. It's beautiful. It's modern. It's clean. That's good. Why do you go to that church? The loving. The people are loving. They're friendly. What do they teach? I don't know, but they're friendly. Or they have an exciting worship service. It's exciting. These are some of the reasons that people pick a church. Now, all of those things are good. It's great if you can go to the same church that your family's always gone to. If the music is good, I mean, you don't want it to be like feeding time at the zoo when they start singing, right? You want to have a good children's program. It's good if the pastor can keep you awake. It's good if it's close to the house and they got a modern, clean building. And all of those things are good. But not one of those things, which happen to be the main reasons people pick a church, not one of them is the right reason. 
the one right reason to pick a church is the foundational teachings of that church are the teachings of Jesus Christ. Amen. Read the ingredients. Do not be fooled by the marketing on the box. And a lot of pastors right now, they're designing their churches. They'll do surveys in the community and say, what do these people want? I'm going to design my church to meet the felt needs of these people. Is that what Jesus did? Or Jesus say, this is the truth and this is what you need. You need salvation from sin. Instead of saying, we're going to create a church to reach the people, God is not wanting a church that will change to morph into the culture because, quite frankly, our culture is sick. God wants a church that is going to change the culture because they're standing for the truth. So when you want to know, what church do I join? Choose very carefully. And you want to make sure it matches with the Bible. Now, did that make sense? Amen. All right, with that as a foundation, how do we find this woman in the last days? How did Solomon figure out which was the real mother? He used the sword. We find the truth by the word of God, the sword of God's word. Amen? Amen. Number seven. How did Jesus say that we demonstrate our love for him? Honk your horn and shout. Is that what he said? No, he said, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. And then you read on here in John, 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. God wants us to be obedient. And this is one of the criteria. A church is going to be teaching the word of God and the law of God because how do you know you need a savior unless you're saved from sin? And when you understand the love of God through the law of God, you become a loving church because he's forgiven you for your sins. I heard uh, an amazing fact a few years ago about uh, 1775, this ship was sailing north of Greenland in a very remote part of the frozen Arctic waters and it saw a derelict ship, three-mast sailboat, drifting among the icebergs. The captain approached and they put off a landing party and they began to explore this ship. It was a ship called the Octavius, true story. And they thought maybe it had been abandoned, but actually it was so cold that they discovered that the whole crew was still on the boat, frozen. In their hammocks, some of them standing up or leaning against the mast, they had been overwhelmed by a terrible burst of cold weather that was so cold that the captain was still sitting at his desk with pen in hand making his last entry in the log. And they saw the last entry was 13 years earlier. This ship had been drifting up there, probably every winter got encased in ice and then thawed out again in the Arctic. All of these people were in their positions frozen. And you wonder how many churches there are in the world today that everyone's going through the motions but they're kind of frozen. You know, Jesus said in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. And that describes a lot of churches. They don't have the power of God, just everyone kind of in position, no life. God's church is going to have real life through his word in the last days. Number eight, what three angelic messages will God's end time church be preaching? Now, you're going back to our Bible, you look in what well, we've been doing, Bible verses through the whole program, but I want to pick up my Bible. Revelation chapter 14 First, I want you to notice, if you look in Revelation 14, you'll see here, it says in verse 14, Revelation 14, 14, I looked and behold a white cloud, and one on the cloud sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the temple saying, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap the harvest of the earth is ripe. This is Jesus coming in the clouds with his crown to harvest the earth, the coming of Christ. What happens immediately before these verses that talk about the coming of Christ? You look in Revelation 14, verse 6. You have three angel messages that go to the world. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, the true, pure gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud, God, a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. There's a call back to the real gospel just before Christ comes, a great revival of primitive Christianity, returning to the word of God. And not only is he called uh, the um, worship God, his judgment has become, it says worship him that made, the creator. 
in a world where we're being told that everything evolved. It says we're called back to the Creator. Another angel calling, second angel, Babylon is fallen. Third angel, if any man worships a beast in his image, a warning about these last day uh, prophecies and powers that are going to be fighting against God's people. This message is to go to the world just before Christ comes. And quite frankly, that's why we do these meetings, to proclaim the three angel messages to get the world ready for Jesus' return. So what are those messages? Number one, answer A, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Have you been hearing about the hour of God's judgment? That we're living in the last phase of Christian history right now. The church of Laodicea means a judging of the people. Judgment begins at the house of God. And if ever God's people needed a revival, because soon, it says prepare yourself, soon we will all face the living God and worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs or fountains of water. That's a quote taken from the fourth commandment about the Sabbath. It says we remember the Sabbath because he's our creator. It's, it's a call to remember that God is the creator. Second angel's message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. We've got a study coming this week on Babylon and a call to come out of Babylon. This is the false teachings are being exposed. She's made all nations drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So it's a calling to return to the truth. And then in Isaiah 13, some, just in case you're wondering, it's not talking about ancient Babylon where Saddam Hussein was trying to rebuild the city. Isaiah 13 said, that Babylon is never going to be rebuilt again. It's talking about spiritual Babylon. It says, and Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation. Babylon was never rebuilt. It's talking about spiritual Babylon. Answer C, third angel then followed them saying with a loud voice of anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, he himself will also drink from the wine of the wrath of God. Now the mark of the beast is mentioned there in Revelation 13. That's coming this weekend. Don't miss any of these presentations. And it says those that worship the beast or receive the mark of the beast, the most fearful curse pronounced in the Bible is in the book of Revelation on those who worship the beast in his image. And we'll find out more about that. Number nine, to whom will God's church preach these messages in the last days? having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. This is to be a global message and a global movement. The whole world needs to hear it. Number 10, what specifications has God given in his word to help us positively identify his end time church? It says it will appear and do its visible work after it emerges from the wilderness in 1798. All right, I'm just gonna I'm going to spell some things out for you. When I became a Christian, I shared my testimony. I was up in the cave. And um, I accepted Christ. Came from a Jewish background. Had absolutely no, um, what do you call it, prejudice about any particular denomination because I didn't have any. I said, Lord, I guess I need to start going to church. And so I went to church on Sunday, met a lot of beautiful people. And I... I was just hungry. I went from church to church to church trying to find out what the truth was. I was so moved by the truth of the Bible. And, and I kept running into differences. They all disagreed on different doctrines. And you know, one church said, unless you're a member of our church, you're not part of the 144,000. I went to another church and they said, unless you speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. I went to another church and they said, oh, you got to go to our church if you want to be saved. And everybody disagreed and they were teaching vastly different doctrines. And I got a little frustrated. I went back to the mountains, went back up to my cave, and I prayed. I said, Lord, there's one Bible, there's one Jesus Christ. It makes sense there's one truth. The Bible says one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I said, Lord, I want you to show me the truth. And after I prayed that prayer, somebody came by my cave, 3,500 feet up in these desert mountains where I was by myself, and gave me a book. It was a book on Bible prophecy. A book, by the way, was called The Great Controversy. How many of you ever heard of that book? <laughs> yeah, great book. If you've not read that, I highly recommend it. I started reading that book. It was filled with scripture and explaining things. I thought, wow, this all makes perfect sense. And that's when I fell in love with the, tru the truth. And by the way, 
Uh, I found out later from the friend that gave me that book, I said, are there people somewhere that believe these things? They got a church anywhere? So oh, yeah, they're all over the world. I'd never ever heard of Seventh-day Adventists, which is sort of an indictment because I lived in New York City and Miami and Boston and, and Maine and LA and I'd never even heard of them. And he said, oh yeah, they're all over the world. And I began to visit that church and continued going to church on Sunday. And I became convinced. I said, this is the truth. I decided if I'm going to join a church, I want to join a church I can defend biblically. And I don't think I should ever be apologetic about saying, friends, um, I want to just show you what I learned from God's word. You take the Bible for yourself and see if it makes sense. Does that sound fair? Find out what the Bible says. So this movement, the Seventh-day Adventist movement began in about 18, well, it was organized in 1863, but it was following a period where a lot of Christians around the world thought Jesus was coming and he didn't come. And they began to research the Bible for themselves. And you had Methodists and Presbyterians and Catholics and Baptists, and they all said, let's put aside our denominational differences, open our Bibles, find out what does the Bible actually teach. And from that infancy of studying the Bible with a fresh approach, this has grown to be the fastest growing Protestant movement in the world, numbering over 20 million right now, because people are returning to the Word of God. Now, we recognize there are Christian people in many different churches, but there's a reason that people believe what they believe. This church met that criteria of forming after the 1798 period. We got a subject coming another night talking about America in prophecy. It'll teach the same truths as the apostles taught. Its teachings will agree with the Bible. That's the main criteria. It'll keep the Ten Commandments, not just eight or nine, but the one about not worshiping idols, remembering the Sabbath day, it'll believe in the whole law of God. Amen? D, it'll have the spirit of prophecy. It says the woman keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus, which we read in Revelation 19, is the spirit of prophecy. It will proclaim God's three end time messages. Those are the three angels' messages, which we are doing around the world. It'll be a worldwide movement. There are about 200, 198 countries in the world. It's hard to know because some, you're not so sure if they're countries or not. Um, our church is in 185 of 198 countries around the world. It'll teach the everlasting gospel, which is salvation by faith in Jesus Christ alone. We believe you're not saved by keeping the law any more than other churches believe you're saved by keeping the commandment that says don't steal. We just think the Sabbath is one of them. But we believe that we are saved by faith uh, in Jesus Christ, by his grace through faith in Christ alone. Now, Jesus gives us these seven prophetic identif uh, identification points, and he says, go find my church. What does he promise regarding your search? What does the Bible say? What did Jesus say? Seek, and you will find. Now, where do we do our searching? We search in the word of God. How many church organizations in the world are going to fit these seven points? When you start looking and you say, I'm going to focus in on what the Bible says, you can eliminate a lot of churches very quickly if you say, does that church teach that you die and go right to heaven or hell before a judgment and a resurrection? It's amazing how many churches teach that. It's not in the Bible, we've learned. Does that church teach that hell burns through endless ages for the sins of one brief lifetime? That quickly eliminates a lot of churches right there. These are some of the doctrines of Babylon that just aren't in the Bible. The Bible says there's what? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. This idea that all the rivers lead to the ocean is not true. We don't accept that in any other area of our life. If you're involved in programming a computer or doing brain surgery or building a building and you say, well, it doesn't matter if you use a ruler with 12 inches or three quarters of an inch or there are absolute truths that our whole life depends on certain absolute truths but when it comes to religion everyone thinks well who knows and here we're dealing with eternity there is a truth and Jesus said the truth will set you free you need to know what that is number 13 many denominations call themselves Christians does that make them God's true church you look in Isaiah 4 verse 1 and in that day, seven women will take hold of one man, 
saying, we'll eat our own food, we'll wear our own apparel, only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. Seven is sort of a number for completeness in the Bible, and it's saying there's just going to be complete apostasy in the last days. You've got all these different women. What's a woman represent? Church. And they say, we're going to eat our own bread. What is that bread? Bible. We've got our own interpretation of the Bible. And we're going to wear our own clothes, not your clothes. It's talking about the righteousness of Christ. But we do want to keep your name, the name of Jesus, Christian, to take away our reproach. Because the Bible says there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And so this is what's happening. You've got all these different churches out there, and they, they kind of just are making up their own style of religion. The Bible is very clear what the truth is. Number 14, once a person discovers God's true end time church, is it necessary to become a member? The Bible tells us in Acts 2, verse 47, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Did it matter? You, you're either, Christ said, you're either with me or against me. And so there were people who said, I am going to commit to being a follower. Number 15, how many ways of escape were there in Noah's day? How many arks did God build? <laughs> did Noah build? By faith, Noah prepared 23 arks. He prepared an ark. That one ark also had one door for the saving of his house. Number 16, since there are so many faithful Christians in other churches, you hear me, friends? I want to make sure you get that. Don't walk away from this meeting saying, Pastor Doug says he's the only one being saved because he knows the church. There are good people in many different churches, but things are going to be changing in the last days. Since he's got other people in many churches, and there's only one true remnant church, remnant means the remainder in the last time, what will happen to these sincere Christians? The words of Jesus, John 10, verse 1, And other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And there will be one fold and one shepherd. So what's going to happen? He said, I'm going to bring them together. There's going to be a shaking in the last days. We see the world is being polarized in many ways now. People are polarized based on their countries. People are polarized now over racial issues. People are polarized over political issues. And there's going to be a big polarization over religion. And there's going to be a shaking in the world. And those that want to follow Jesus and his word, they're going to kind of shake off in one direction. They're going to have the other's going to shake off into the other direction. One's going to have the seal of God. One's going to have the mark of the beast. One's going to be the true bride. One's going to be Babylon. And this is how things are shaping up right now. And I don't believe it's an accident you're hearing what you're hearing right now. I believe that God is wanting you to know that he wants you to be his child, and you need to read the ingredients, friends. Just don't say, well, I think it's whatever you feel or all rivers lead to the ocean. What does the word of God say? That's going to be your only safety in the last days. Now, I want to give you an opportunity to make a decision about what you heard tonight. I'm going to ask our ushers to come and we want to give you a card. And you at home, you're going to see this on your screen as well. We want you to be able to make a decision about what you've heard because we want to pray for you to do something tangible. I'm going to invite John and uh, Kelly to come. They're going to be singing a familiar verse. I want to go through these questions with you that I'd like to pray. And they'll be singing as, as you uh, make your decisions. Please write your name on your envelope. It doesn't do any good to preach the gospel without giving people an opportunity to respond. Let me tell you what the questions are. Question number one, I have accepted Jesus as my Savior, and I desire to follow him where he leads. I hope everyone can say yes to that. Question number two, I see from the Bible that God has a remnant people in these last days. The Bible tells us that he, he calls a remnant to save them. Number three, I desire to worship him in spirit and truth and would like to join God's remnant church. And then the fourth question, you still have questions on the subject. You'd like to talk to a pastor or one of the Bible workers and, and uh, or maybe you want to study the, su the subject more. But I'd like to pray for you as you're filling this out. And then we're going to have John sing a song. Bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, I pray you'd be with each person. Uh, some maybe are making decisions right now, tonight, that may influence their eternity. 
I pray that if they've heard the truth tonight, if the Holy Spirit has stirred their hearts, they'll recognize that and they'll open their hearts and they'll respond to your call. One of the ways we come to you, Lord, is you said that the church is your body. You want us to be in Christ, in your body in the last days, just as Noah's family was in the ark. I pray that they'll make that decision to say yes and to follow you right now. In Christ's name, amen. John? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Listen. Though none go with me, Still I will follow Though none go with me Still I will follow Though none go with me Still I will follow No turning back No turning Quick story, I was driving down the road one day delivering sandwiches, worked for this company, saw a man walking through the desert with a brown bag, I picked him up, he got in my car and said, praise the Lord, I said, you a Christian? He said, yes, I said, well, so am I, he said, praise the Lord, I was back when I was first learning the things I'm sharing with you, he said, do you go to church? I said, well, in fact, I do, he said, what day do you go? I said, Sunday? He said, do you know what day the Sabbath is? I said, yes, yeah, Saturday. He said, praise the Lord. I said, oh, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? He said, a what? Seventh-day Adventist? He'd never heard of him. We got into a Bible study while all the sandwiches were thawing out in the back of the truck. He believed everything I'm sharing during the seminar. And I said, where'd you get all this? He said, it's the Bible. And I sometimes wonder if I picked up an angel that day. I never saw him again. I bought him something to eat, and that was the end of that. And he, he knew everything that I'm sharing with you. And I think it was God's way of confirming to, to me, this is not about following a church or a human creed. It's about following the Word of God. God's going to have a people in the last days, and I believe he wants you to be part of that. And so I, I hope and pray that you'll make your decision to accept Jesus. That's first and foremost. But if you accept Christ, he says then you, he wants you to be part of his church, his body. I trust that that's your prayer. Jesus said, Babylon has fallen. Come out of her, my people. We not only come out of Babylon, we come into God's fold. Is that your prayer tonight, friends? Can I pray with you for that? Father in heaven, I pray that you will now nourish the word that was shared with the water of the Holy Spirit, that living water, and help it spring up and bear fruit in our lives. Be with each person that's been listening, um, worshiping you, and being part of a church family is such an important part of Bible teaching. Help us to learn to apply that to our lives and take a step of faith in Christ's name. Amen. All right, friends, God bless you. When is our next meeting? We're talking about refusing Babylon's buffet. You don't want to miss that. You can still bring your friends and continue to come to the seminar.